Here in this hymn, Isaac Watts, the composer or the writer of the lyrics, gives us, I think, um, the meaning of the death of Jesus as he saw it. As you were singing and as you were looking at the words, for him the death of Jesus certainly speaks of the love of God. How God displayed his love for such a sinful, rebellious people by sending the Prince of Glory, as Watts writes, to suffer and to die. In surveying the cross upon which the Prince of Glory died, Watts, of course, saw his own worthlessness and the supreme worthiness of Jesus. In his grasping of what it meant for Jesus to die, he saw his own need to submit to him as he says that such love demands my soul, my life, and my all. But not all grasp the purpose for Jesus dying And we see that in the text that I want to share with you today. And it happens to be the 12 disciples of Jesus. That they didn't have an understanding, they didn't grasp why Jesus must die. And so the question though before us today is do we, do we grasp the meaning of his death? And if so, what is the impact of having such a knowledge that he died on the cross, how is that impacting your life right now? Now, these are questions that I, that I want to address in this message that I've titled this morning, Grasping the Death of Jesus. So turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke and to chapter number 18. I want to begin the reading at verse 31 and reading through verse 34. And at the conclusion of the reading of our sermon text this morning, please note that we do have a responsive reading that we will speak together from Psalm 18, verse 30. It's in your bulletin and as well, I think it'll be projected behind me on the wall. So now, Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 31, this is the word of God. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted upon. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, that is, the disciples. And this saying was hid from them, Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Would you join me now as we read? And I will begin the reading, and then you respond in the, with the bold print. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. And let's pray. Eternal God, our Father in heaven, we humbly come before you now expressing a great need. It is the need to know your word. It is the need for your word to sink deep within our hearts and our minds. And especially, it is the need to know this morning about the great sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Lord, we confess before you that we need help. We need our minds to be opened. We need our hearts to be able to receive your word. And we need the work of the Spirit that does these things to make application of the words so that we may be moved by them. And how in every way in which you desire to move us, whether it would be, be conviction, bringing conviction that we are sinners in need of Christ, whether it be through encouragement to continue on, to press on, to persevere in the faith while living in a very troubled world. O Lord, speak to us now. Use me as your instrument. For your word, as we have just spoke together, is tried, it's true, it's pure, it's perfect. Help us to understand it this morning, whereby then we may be more devoted to you. Help us, we pray. Guide us, O Holy Spirit. For this we do pray now, in the name of the one who is called the Word, the Word who was made flesh, the Word who was who dwelt among us, the Word who saves us. His name is Jesus, and how thankful we are for him. It's in his name that we pray, and amen. I would think most of you probably have heard the saying, three strikes and you're out. Now, you certainly have heard that if you are a baseball fan. But these words are not limited to the sphere of a baseball game. But they have become somewhat of an idiom uh, in our language that is descriptive of, of some other things. Mainly, uh, descriptive of one's continuing failure to achieve some stated goal. So often you hear that in that way. Also, I remember, I think a, a, a number of years ago, there was either not a national legislation uh, or perhaps more it was state legislation uh, that was passed called the three-strike rule. That is, if you happen to be convicted for a third time of some criminal violation, then uh, it required the judge to uh, uh, bring a sentence upon you that, that was uh, a harsher sentence. Perhaps to receive the maximum sentence for the last crime that you committed. And so we, we have this kind of general understanding of this phrase, three strikes and you're out. Well, what we see here in our text is yet another example of this three strikes and you're out analogy. And we see it in the disciples of Jesus, the 12 disciples, the disciples that he chose, that they are hearing for the third time in Luke's gospel account, Jesus speaking about his impending death. And for the third time, they fail to grasp it. They fail to understand what he is saying. In chapter 9, verse 22, uh, we go back there and we see the first occasion of this. In Luke chapter 9, verse 22, Jesus said this, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. Of course, the disciples then didn't understand what he was saying. 
Then in the same chapter, verse 44, chapter 9, Jesus said, Let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But once again, the, it didn't sink down into their ears what Jesus was saying. And then here in the text that I just read to you, once again, Jesus says in verse 32, For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on, and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Once again, they couldn't understand what he was saying. In verse 34 it says, And they, meaning the twelve disciples, understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Three strikes, and they were out. And even after the death of Jesus and after his resurrection, they were still puzzled. They were still confused about what had happened, what had just occurred. And it wasn't only until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given to them as Jesus had promised that they began to comprehend what his death meant, what his resurrection meant as well. Now, for us this morning, it is not a matter of us grasping the fact that Jesus died, for we are looking back in history. And it was a historical fact that he was crucified upon the cross we are also not in the position of the disciples uh, as they were leading up to the time in which Jesus would die on the cross to have this uh, secular view of who the Messiah would be when he would come. They, they, they had a hard time understanding what Jesus was saying because they had it in their own minds that when the Messiah would come, that he would not forgive them of their sins and caused them to have eternal life, but rather they believed that when Messiah come, he would set up a literal kingdom on the earth, much like uh, what occurred in the days of David and Solomon. And so, because they had this more secular view of who the Messiah is or was, they couldn't grasp that he must die. And so the question for us is not that Jesus died, but do we fully grasp why it was that he must die? And, and, and then that leads to an even greater question, is do we fully grasp how we are then to live out our lives, knowing that he died? But not just knowing that he died but that he died for you, that he died for me. Are we, brothers and sisters, friends, are we personally, are we corporately living with this grasp of the understanding of Jesus dying? Are we living as the body of Christ here at Lanes? Are we living worthy of this great sacrifice offered by Jesus upon the cross? Are we living worthy of him dying for us? Do we, as we just sung a few moments ago in this great hymn by Isaac Watts, do we count our richest gains in the world but loss? In our surveying of the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, do we pour contempt on all our pride? 
Do the thoughts of Jesus dying for you personally result in you moving, in moving you to give your all for him? You see, such are the questions that we ought to ask ourselves, not just today, but periodically, maybe perhaps every day. You see, because sin, living in a sinful, fallen world, it's so easy for us to lose our perspective on life itself as a follower of Jesus. But it's, as we live out our life here with all of its struggles, with all of its trials, we begin to even lose perspective of what Jesus did on the cross. Now, for us to be able to properly address these questions, we need to make sure that we have an understanding of why Jesus must die. And so I want us to consider in the text that is before us, uh, I want to look at two divisions here. First, the failure of the disciples to grasp why Jesus must die. And then secondly, how our grasping, if you will, of the purpose of Jesus' death is to impact how we live in a fallen world. So then first, let's consider from the text the failure of the disciples to grasp or to understand why it was necessary <coughs> for Jesus to die. In verse 1, we look and it reads this, Then he, that is Jesus, took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning of the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Now, now Jesus and, and his disciples, they, they've left the area of Galilee uh, where Jesus' ministry while he was on the earth was focused. It was centered there in, in Galilee. And, and, of course, he is traveling now to Jerusalem for the last time. And we, we, we remember back in that ninth chapter of Luke that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. He had gone there the previous years of his ministry to, to the di different feast days, but, but this is a different journey for him. It's the last journey before he dies on the cross. And, and as they are traveling now to Jerusalem, along the way he has encountered many different uh, groups of people. You remember he encountered the, the lepers, the ten lepers, healing them. And only one of them, you remember, came back to give thanks to him. He, he's engaged a number of times with, with uh, the Pharisees, uh, teaching them about the nature of the kingdom of God, how it is uh, that people should live uh, in the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God was within them, it wasn't going to be a, a literal kingdom where you look at it and see uh, there that it's there in Jerusalem uh, and so forth. And there have been occasions as well where uh, along this road now to Jerusalem that Jesus has taken his disciples, the ones that he has chosen, the ones that who will go and be his witnesses into all the earth. He brings them to himself to teach them important lessons. And we see here that, there, that this is such an instance where he takes them aside and to tell them what is needful for them to know in order for them to then carry out their future ministry of being his witnesses and of particularly making disciples. And what we should take from this, brothers and sisters, and what I need to take from this as well, is that we too need these moments of gathering by faith at the feet of Jesus for him to teach us about those things necessary for us to know so that we can faithfully 
fulfill our task that He has given to us of ministering the gospel and of making disciples. You see, we cannot neglect our own spiritual welfare. We need these special times of teaching. We can't be ignorant, you see, of the teachings of God's Word. And and sometimes I think we can become too busy, maybe even in, in the carrying out of our tasks as disciples, that we fail to see how ineffective we really are. How much we have lost perspective about the matters that that are of great importance. I think we tend to be like Martha was. Remember a number of weeks ago, Martha being cumbered about with the duties of hosting all those people and she forgot what was truly important. And that was being where her sister Mary was at the feet of Jesus, listening to him. You see, without these moments of us being at the feet of Jesus, being pulled aside as it is from the things of this world to be taught by Him, we too can lose sight of the big picture. We can become entangled in matters that will ultimately weaken our ministry. And thus we become ineffective witnesses of Jesus And what we see here in this passage is that what is important for our ministry of the gospel is to rightly grasp, it is to rightly understand what the death of Jesus means to us. What it means for our redemption. And what we see here again is that the disciples, they just don't get it. Even though the death of Jesus, the death of the Messiah, was prophesied of in the Old Testament. What Jesus is disclosing here by speaking of his impending death is to tell them that that this is one of the foundational pillars upon which this great building of the church rests upon. For this was the purpose for him coming into the world to begin with. He came to give his life. And that was the purpose for the Messiah coming that was was prophesied of in the Old Testament. And so Jesus says, behold. That is, listen. Listen carefully. Pay attention. We go up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Now, as as we think about this, as, as I have thought about this, when Jesus is, is saying these things to his disciples, He knows. He knows the end is at hand. He knows that which he was sent to do is about to happen. He knows that the cross is before him. He knows he's going to suffer. He knows that this is the will of the Father for him. You you remember even in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night that they came to arrest Jesus, he is struggling. He is struggling emotionally. He is struggling spiritually. He asked that the cup that he was about to drink from would be taken away from him. And yet, He said, not my will, but the will of the Father is going to be done. He's going to die. But he's not just going to die. He's going to die because of sin. 
not his sin, but for our sins. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Of course, Peter, no doubt, has in mind what the prophet Isaiah wrote some 700 or so years before. All this, you see, that must be accomplished in Jerusalem has been prophesied by the prophets. And that's what Jesus is saying. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Now what things are written? Well, He soon will be uh, turned over and delivered unto the Gentiles. That's what verse 32 says. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles. That is, he is going to be delivered to the Romans. And why is he going to be delivered to the Romans? It is because he's going to be judged by the Father. This is, this is a, a statement of judgment here. R.C. Sproul, writing about this, this particular passage, says, to be placed in the hands of the Gentiles was to be sent outside the covenant community, outside the camp, outside the place where the presence of God was concentrated and focused. He is to be delivered to the Gentiles to receive the judgment of God. Again, on our account. And this is what you and I must grasp. We must understand that He died for us. We must grasp that He was mocked or derided by the people because of us. We must grasp that He was spitefully entreated or mistreated, ridiculed, insulted because of us, because of you and me. We must grasp that he was spit upon as if he was but a dog. The Prince of Glory, Watts described Jesus, was spit upon by his own creation. And this happened at, uh, as the prophet said would happen because of you and me. And we must grasp, you see, that he suffered all these things and he died in the worst way that a man could die by crucifixion. And he did this so that you and I must have or could have eternal life. You see, the disciples of Jesus didn't understand that. But they will come to understand it. And the question again to us is, do we understand this? The scriptures say that Jesus will be mocked. He will be jeered and derided by the people. As I said, as I mentioned, this is uh, prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4 we, we read these words surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed he was oppressed and he was afflicted. For what purpose did he suffer and die? For what purpose was, was he oppressed and afflicted? Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. It was for our healing. It was for us to be one day with him in glory 
forever. Beloved, Jesus must suffer and die to save you from your sins. And he willingly endured being mocked, spitefully entreated. He willingly endured the taunts of men being spit upon. He endured being whipped until his flesh was torn from off of his back by being scourged. Such was the torture he received that, again, by way of prophecy, his own friends would not have recognized him. This he must endure for our sakes to redeem us. He must die. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 2, 12 rather, verse 2 says this, looking unto to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy that was set before him, what was that joy? Was it not for his people to be with him forever in glory? And so he's telling his disciples, behold, we go up to Jerusalem for all of these terrible things to be accomplished so that redemption of his people would be accomplished. And that is why he came into this world. And that is why he died on the cross. And the disciples failed to grasp this. Verse 34 again, and they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. But as I said, there would be a day that they would. In John chapter 16, verse 4, Jesus is speaking of the purpose of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That he would send to his disciples. And there it reads this, but these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And so Jesus is laying the groundwork here for that moment when, I guess another way we would say, when the light comes on, right? And that light came on in a powerful way on the day of Pentecost when Peter, interesting enough, was one of the ones who first said when Jesus told uh, about his impending death, G Peter, Peter, as being Peter, he, 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 he said, not so, Lord. This is not your purpose. And Jesus said, what? Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And so it has continued to be ever since that day that there are those who are of men who fail to grasp that it was of God that Jesus should die. It was of God because that is what it took to save you and me from being destroyed. Be, from perishing. Do you grasp what the disciples failed to grasp? Well, if so, then I would ask you, so what? So what? What does that mean for you and me today in living out our life, having this understanding of why Jesus died? So what? I remember hearing of a, a seminary professor speaking to his group of students on a preaching class, and he told every one of them that one day they would find him back in the back pew. They wouldn't know when it would be, but that when they would see him on the back pew, that they were to be reminded and in their preaching of giving the application. So what? So what? 
Well, I don't want you to leave here today asking the question, so what? But rather, I would hope you would leave today asking the question that those did on the day of Pentecost, having heard this same Peter who had failed to understand why Jesus must be crucified when he stood up among the people that day and preached Christ crucified. And the scriptures say that the question that was asked by those who, who, who heard that message and that message resonated deep within them, they asked, what shall I do? Or what shall we do? And that's the question that I want to ask you. What is it that we ought to do? Having this knowledge of the death of Christ Isaac Watts responded to his surveying of the cross by saying, Jesus demanded, oh, his life is all. Isn't that the response that you and I ought to have? How is it that we can come to the point, brothers and sisters, friends, if we say that we grasp the meaning of the death of Jesus, how can it be that we can come to the point of saying that I'm unwilling to give Him my soul, my life, and my all? And yet, we see this. We are prone to do this, aren't we? How easy is it for us to sometimes get up on a Sunday morning and say, well, I won't go to the house of God to praise God today because... I want to enjoy my day. I want to do something else. We all are prone to do this. If we are all honest with ourselves, and, and I'm speaking of me as well, we could all, as it were, up our game, couldn't we? We all could do better in serving Jesus. Our prayer life. Our study of God's Word. Our witnessing to others. That's perhaps one of the great areas where we fail so often. And yet, we have an understanding of what Jesus has done for us in saving us from our sins, why wouldn't we want to tell others that they too can come to know one who will deliver them from their sins, from the wages of their sins? Couldn't we use the talents better? That, Jesus, that we have been given by God to serve God. We each, every single one of you here in this congregation has something to offer in the service of Christ. And then sometimes we say, well, I don't have anything. Or we, we look so poorly upon what we have. Jesus wants your heart. You give him your heart. And then you'll do what you can for him. What does it mean to you for Jesus to have died? Paul said this, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, 
not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, I think in those words there we see that Paul had a grasp of what it meant for Jesus to die. And he was ready to die for Jesus. He was ready to give up everything that this world thinks is gain for the sake of Christ. You know, too many of us, I fear, living in this land of plenty, we give in to the allurement of worldly pleasures. And we are not willing to count such things as loss. But brothers and sisters, as we come to grasp more and more of what Jesus did in in him dying for us, Let us be renewed in our resolve to not let this happen. That is, not let the things of this world become a priority with us above that of serving Christ. In a moment, we're going to sing, Jesus paid it all. And he did. He paid the price for your redemption. He paid the price of my redemption. And he paid that costly price by his suffering and by his dying. How is it then that we should respond to our sins being washed away? Well, may it be said, or may we say it together, all to him I owe. I pray that that's our heart's desire here at Lane's Church, to give him our all. That's what we owe him, for him dying for us. The disciples of Jesus, having seen, as we've seen here in the text, they struck out. But praise the Lord, they got another at bat. On the day of Pentecost, when the ministry of the Spirit, they, I suppose, using a continuing uh, baseball analogy, they hit a grand slam, didn't they? But it's because of the Spirit who opened the eyes of people that day to see their need for Christ. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. That's what we sung a few moments ago. Well, Jesus has been given to us. What are we giving to him? Father in heaven, I do ask now for measures of grace to be given to us, to everyone here in this congregation, to see their need for Christ. To see why it is that he came into this world leaving the glory that he had to become a servant, taking on flesh and blood, to become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And he did that for me. Oh God, may we hear, think, And meditate upon this great truth. And may it spur us. May it move us. May it motivate us. To give him our all. Oh God, help us we pray. To see these things. For it's in the. Beloved and blessed name of Jesus who gave his all that I pray and amen.